everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session, where we'll be looking at how to create an easement. My name is Stephen Smith, and I'm delighted to be joined by Ian Quayle, Robert Kelly, and our guest speaker today, Tim Calland. A uh, brief, brief introduction to Tim. Uh, Tim has more than 20 years experience providing advice and advocacy across a full range of commercial chancery litigation, and much of his practice relates to property litigation with particular expertise in property cases that involve company insolvency, trust or financial law, as well as related property uh, professional neg negligence. Excuse me. Uh, before I hand over to Ian and Tim, I'd just like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You're listening by default through your computer speaker system. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, please just select the telephone option in your audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to Ian and Tim by typing your questions in the questions pane of your control panel. You can send in questions at any time during the presentation, but we will collect these and address them during a Q&A at the end of today's presentation. You can also raise your hand. There's a raise hand function if you're having any uh, issues with the technical side of the webinar. If you're having trouble hearing or can't see anything, please do get in touch. Get in touch with me over the chat function or the question function, and we'll be able to take a look at that for you and hopefully resolve any issues. Finally, before I hand over, we've also included the notes for today's session, um, which you can access through the handout section of your control panel. If you're having any issues, again, please do get in touch. We have a copy of the notes here. We'll be very happy to share. So just either email me or contact me on the the chat or, or question function. But uh, anyway, without further ado, I will pass over to Tim and Ian for the main part of the presentation. Thanks, Bo. Thank you, Stephen, and thanks everyone for joining us. And Tim, a big thanks to you for coming along today to assist us in this conversation in connection with easements. What I want to do today is to share with you some sort of general views relating to easements. And I will be asking Tim for comment and view as we sort of progress and also asking Robert, Robert Kelly from Stuart Title to assist us with regard to issues relevant to defective title insurance and easements. So to start with, we're reminding conveyances of some of the general issues relating to advice that we ought to be giving with regard to easements. Then what we'll do is look at some of the traps involved in prescriptive easements. And Tim, if we may, will sort of um, rely upon you to give us some assistance and some guidance in connection with some recent case law that you've been involved with concerning the registration of easements and issues in a, a, associated with prescriptive easements. So that would be really useful. We'll have a look as well, which will be useful for transactional lawyers and litigators, how the land registry deal with contested applications to register easements. And again, uh, Kim's, uh, Tim's been at the sort of uh, the, the front of this and uh, has some, uh, some experience with regard to a very successful application that was made to tribunal in order to get an easement, a prescriptive easement registered. So lots and lots of things to talk about. Um, if anyone has any questions, there is a chat facility. There's also an opportunity to take questions at the end. And as Stephen rightly says, if we run out of time or there's too many questions or you're too shy to raise questions as we are doing the presentation, feel free to drop either myself or Tim or um, Robert and Stephen a note and we'll endeavour to assist. So first of all, Tim, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I appreciate you. you're very busy and uh, you've got uh, lots of work to do, but uh, I'm delighted that you're going to share with us a very interesting case concerning uh, prescriptive easements and land registration issues. And the first question really I have for you uh, concerns how your practice and how your experience sort of impacts on residential conveyances and transactional property lawyers, in that you had some sort of first-hand experience of a prescriptive easement that required registration at the land registry that culminated in an application to tribunal. And the first thing I'd like to ask you really as a starting point is your view about the role of the tribunal in connection with land registry applications. My view is that this is a forum for dispute resolution that in the past transactional property lawyers might be happy to sort of play at and say, well, all right, I've got my client in a situation. We need to register this, this um, um, easement or there's a dispute with regard to an easement that's in the course of registration. 
I can deal with the tribunal application myself. My view would be this isn't an area that a transactional property lawyer can play at. And I'd just welcome your views as a sort of preliminary point this morning. Well, I would completely agree, Ian. Um, the uh, litigation in front of the first tier tribunal or the upper tribunal, it's, it's really like litigation in court. I mean, this is virtually indistinguishable. There's been a big, a, a big move over the last 15 years or so to, to um, shift work from some of the non-specialist judges um, in, in the um, county court and to a lesser extent the high court into tribunals with, with um, specialist judges um, uh, who will obviously have the experience and expertise to deal with the, these more technical issues like land registration. And um, one of the important things to, to really keep in mind about, um, the, about litigation in the tribunal is the cost rules. Well, first of all, the rules of evidence are, are, are really very similar to, to, to court. So cases basically need to be prepared in the same way. Um, and um, uh, the cost rules are substantially the same now in, in the land registration jurisdiction. So that um, the okay. successful party can expect to have their costs paid by the unsuccessful party. So in that respect, it's like normal litigation it, rather than a, a uh, rather informal forum for dispute resolution. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Tim. So that then brings into sharp focus this slide and what I'm going to talk about in connection with due diligence. Because, you know, it's not simply a question of making application to register an easement or to oppose uh, the registration process relating to an easement. If we're acting in a transactional sense, there are a number of things that can be done to ensure that we don't find ourselves dealing with an opposed application or dealing with tribunal. So I want to focus in on some basic points here with regard to due diligence. And the first thing I would say when you're acting for a seller is that it's imperative that you audit the title and determine the position with regard to the quality of title and any easements that exist for the benefit of the property or that the property is burdened by to determine whether those easements are potentially latent defects, in which case there'd be an obligation to disclose, or whether they are patent defects, in which case disclosure wouldn't be necessary. And the point that we'll sort of be exploring and amplifying a little further with Tim as we progress is the fact that we have the potential for some easements to be overriding interests, in which case they're not going to necessarily be revealed by an inspection of the title, and they are potentially going to be binding on a buyer for value, and therefore they are, to an extent, creating some vulnerability with regard to both seller and buyer. Seller, on the basis of do I have to disclose this or don't I have to disclose it, and buyer, of course, on the basis that buyer potentially could be bound by easements that they're not aware of. So I think if we're acting for a seller, audit the title, are there easements that benefit the property? Have those easements been properly protected? If we are acting on behalf of a seller, are there any easements that aren't obvious on inspection, that aren't revealed by the title that potentially would be a latent defect? So are there easements that affect the property that are not noted on the title would not be directly obvious on inspection and therefore would be a latent defect that the seller should disclose. For acting for a buyer, and again, this is important, client objective. Why is our client buying the target property? And as far as that uh, purpose is concerned, are there easements that are necessary to facilitate the objective or easements that are reserved over the land that's being acquired that would impede that objective? Very important to assess objective and then look at easements in the bigger picture with regard to client objective and client purpose relating to acquisition. We need to think also about what easements the buyer requires to achieve the uh, objective and do they exist and are they enforceable. And again, it's a point that I frequently emphasize to practitioners, just because an easement is registered and noted on a burdened title does not necessarily mean the easement is in fact enforceable. And we'll talk about issues relating to enforceability relating to prescriptive uh, covenants, so restrictive easements, and um, um, 
prescriptive easements rather, and we'll also talk about the issue of registration relating to such uh, easements in a moment or two. And of course, the issue of whether or not such an easement is an overriding interest. So lots of things to talk about with regard to due diligence and lots of information in the notes relating to them. But the important point I want to make at the start is from the seller's perspective, doing an audit, buyer's perspective, understanding and appreciating the limitations relating to due diligence and the need to inspect target property, client need to inspect target property and to report to you anything that is revealed relating to that inspection. As far as the basics are concerned, we've got to identify that there are two parcels of land. And as far as those parcels of land are concerned, they must be in separate ownership in order for an easement to exist. And Tim, um, I know that when we spoke about your case recently, we discussed the sort of the thorny question of unity of season, which to someone like me and some sort of practitioners dealing with day-to-day -day transactional work would be something perhaps of real academic interest, but not much pr uh, practical interest. But in your case, it was raised, wasn't it? The unity of season. I wonder if you could just explain to delegates today what that is and why it was significant in your case. Of course, yeah. Well, um, unity of season, I would, I would say, is a, is a really important thing to understand and to keep in mind when investigating whether an easement um, exists. Um, and um, in particular, whether an easement remains enforceable. Um, the, the thought behind it is, is that because an easement is a right that one owner, the dominant owner, has over the land of another person, the servient owner, um, that right can only exist for as long as there are two parcels of land and they're in separate ownership. Mm -hmm. So if, if the two part, pieces yeah. of land come into the same ownership, then the the easement just disappears um and so um it, it it matters because if you're you're um investigating whether an easement exists and you've got say an old deed that appears to grant an easement um if the the two plots of land have come into the same ownership at some point um in history since the the grant of the easement then then the easement is likely to have been extinguished there are technicalities ar around it that I won't go into here, but 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 they're easy to to find out about. For, for example, it's not just any uh, 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 commonality of possession. The, the 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 interests need to line up in a particular way for for, for the easement to be extinguished. But that's the, the, that, that's the basic principle, and the way it came up it came up in in my case. Um, was in a fairly unusual way, in, in that the, the case that um, I was involved in recently, that is a good illustration of the principles behind prescriptive easements. Um, it, it was all to do with a lane that ran along the side of a, an ancient churchyard. And um, the, the, the incumbent of the church, which basically is a technical name for the vicar, um, claimed a vehicular right of way up this lane to access the church. And the, the lane had previously been owned. It had previously provided the access to, to the village school. And the village school was, um, um, before it was closed down, um, was owned uh, legally by the incumbent, so the vicar, and the church wardens of the church as trustees um, under an, an, an educational trust. Um, and the school, the, the village school subsequently closed and the site was sold on to to um, some people who built a house there and and they were the ones saying that there was no right of way and the incumbent was saying there was a right of way one of the points that was raised is whether there was sufficient unity of season to have extinguished any right that that the incumbent could establish had existed and the 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 issue as it arose in that case was whether the there was sufficient unity of season so sufficient common ownership given that one parcel was owned entirely by the incumbent the vicar um, on a trust for the church um, and the the lane was owned by the incumbent and the church wardens who are a separate 
um, legal personality, in fact, a corporation aggregate, um, uh, to, to, to use the technical term, um, on, and, and it was held on an, on an educational trust, so a trust for different purposes. And the, the right answer was that that, that wasn't sufficient unity. Um, but it, was, it, 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 it illustrates how when you're looking at parcels of land in close proximity, and you're, if you're looking at rights that are, have possibly existed over quite a, a long period of time, it really pays to dig into and to understand the history of the ownership of the, of the two sites, because you never know what you might turn up. You might turn up yeah. um, a, a, a unity that means that, that, that any right has um, been extinguished. Yeah, Tim, that's brilliant. I'll just turn my camera off again. So, Tim, I think that the, the point from a practitioner's perspective, as you allude to, is to check the history with regard to the dominant serving tenement, just to see if there is an issue, because unity of season is an issue that would potentially kill dead the potential for an easement to arise, albeit in your case, you were able to sort of circumvent the, the problem, uh, given the explanation that you just provided. The next point that the that I think is, is important for practitioners is that the, the easement must be a proprietary right in that it must be a right that the law is willing to accept as an easement. And again, it's quite interesting that the law and the courts have been sort of flexible uh, over recent years to say that car parking is an easement. And the courts have said, well, all right, as far as proprietary rights are concerned, there are limits, but you know the, the door isn't closed with regard to new easements in the future. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the Law Commission has said before we finish today. And then this point about exclusivity is, is, is significant with regard to an easement. Um, you can't have a situation where the uh, owner of the dominant land has exclusivity to the detriment of the owner of the servient land. The servient landowner has still to retain rights with regard to the servient land over which the right of way runs. Um, and the easement mustn't involve the owner of the servient tenement in any form of expense. This is something that I spend a lot of time dealing with and assisting practitioners with, um, with regard to rights of way in particular, issues of repair and maintenance. And this didn't, this really wasn't an issue at all in your case, Tim, was it? But frequently I encounter situations where someone has a right of way over a track, and an example would be the track that's just shown in the photograph here, and the track in the winter months isn't suitable for the owner of the dominant tenement because it gets rutted, it gets flooded, etc. And there are difficulties and issues in using it for access. But as far as the servient owner is concerned, there's no responsibility for repair and maintenance. I think when you are creating easements, it's important, one, to identify the physical extent of the right of way. And where by that, I mean its length and also its width and also to determine issues such as repair and maintenance on the basis that if I'm using this track as an access to my house, I need to make sure that it is to an appropriate standard to let the cars and vehicles utilise it. And there needs to be an arrangement between the owner of the servant tenement, the owner of dominant tenement or tenements with regard to repair and maintenance. And uh, I tell you what's quite interesting, uh, Tim, I'm seeing situations recently where estate rent charges are being utilised to cover the cost of repair and maintenance of rights of way. And that's sort of an area that is developing on the basis that, you know, the idea of freehold, uh, sorry, leasehold developments in connection with new gated developments are not finding favour with the courts or indeed the government. People are disposing of freehold properties uh, dealing with issues relating to access by way of easement, but then dealing with cost and maintenance by way of a state rent charge. I mentioned mm -hmm. that as far as easements are concerned, they do require protection. Sorry, Tim, you were going to say something. No, I just simply said that's interesting. You don't come across the state rent charges very, very much, and um, yeah, interesting it's to, to see them being used creatively. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just, you know, in the past, you'd have a client who was building, I don't know, five or six exclusive homes in a development. And what they would be doing is they would be looking at uh, creating leaseholds. But of course, the government is now saying we don't like leasehold houses. If you've signed up to the, um, the, the pledge that the government required developers to sign up to, you shouldn't be doing this. You should be selling a freehold house. 
but then that creates the problem about what about the gated developments, repair and maintenance for common parks, etc., including access roads. If we just go back to the previous slide, I just wanted to talk for a second about how we protect easements. And again, Tim, I just want to discuss this point with you. Any legal easement requires registration. And as far as that is concerned, um, it is important to understand the way the land registry would operate in that they would put a notice on the servient tenement as the existence of the legal interest. And they may also put a notice in the um, title that benefits from the easement as well. But that's not strictly necessary. But it is right to say that, first of all, we have to think about equitable easements. So we've attempted to create a legal easement and failed due to some irregularity, in which case an equitable easement should be protected by way of notice in the charges register of the servient title. But as far as certain types of prescribed easement, although they are legal interests, they are not subject to any obligation to register or indeed to be noted on the title due to their overriding status. And Tim, I think that was one of the things that was discussed in your case, wasn't it? The existence of the prescriptive easement and its overriding status or otherwise. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, the way it arose in, in, in my case is, is the, the, um, the servient owners had acquired the servient tenement in, in, in the, uh, only a few years before the application was made. And um, so the so the bulk of the period prescription period that was relied upon by my client to establish the existence of the right of way um, uh, related to a period before their ownership. And um, what the servient owners argued was that when they bought the property, because the the easement wasn't registered, their purchase of the property took priority. Um, over the easement uh, on conventional principles um, upon the registration of, of their purchase. Um, and so, so that was the end of our prescriptive claim. Um, obviously, the, the, the response to that is to say, well, well the, the interest, the easement is capable, uh, uh, sorry, not is capable, is in fact an overriding interest and so doesn't need that protection and so exists notwithstanding that it, it, it wasn't protected by registration. And so one of the issues in the case became whether it it was an overriding interest or not. And I think we'll perhaps come on to the details of how you establish that in in a minute. Yeah. But, um, it, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it's often a really important point. And certainly in in in, in the the case that I had, um, it, it became the real battleground. Um, in in the evidence and the cross examination of witnesses, because it became, I think, very very quickly apparent to uh, the servient owners and their counsel that that my client could pretty easily establish use going back decades, um, and you know really very many decades. There were lots of you know yeah. el elderly residents of the village wheeled out to give their recollection of what happened in the 1950s and so on. Uh, um, and and very yeah. quickly, everyone focused on the period in the immediate run up to the purchase by the Serbian owners, because that became became arguably one of the turning points of the overriding interest question. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. So from a practitioner's perspective, if we're acting for buyers, it is absolutely essential that we tell the buyers the significance of their inspection, what they should be looking out for, and remember that those four things that they should be looking out for, identifying physical extent of the property and confirming that plans and description are consistent with what you see when you inspect, to satisfy the obligation to let the buyer be aware, so the state and condition of the property is inspected by the um, client and verified to be satisfactory from a client's perspective, more on that in a moment or two to identify that the questions that are raised within the TA forms have been answered satisfactorily. So using the TA forms as a checklist during the inspection to make sure that what the seller says seem, seems to be consistent with what you see. And then lastly, this point about overriding interests. 
So I think it's important as a residential conveyance or a commercial property lawyer, when we're advising a client to inspect, we're telling them the sorts of things to look out for and the things to report to us. So in Tim's case, where we're acting for the respondents in the land registry application, the buyers of the servient uh, tenement in this particular case, we should be saying to the client, look, you need to check carefully the position with regard to your property for the four reasons that I mentioned, one of which being the existence of overriding interests, explaining to the client what overriding interests are. And I think, Tim, in a situation like this, where you've got a client buying a property where clearly there's a lane of types uh, adjoining it or in the vicinity, it would be worthwhile as a transactional property lawyer saying to their client, just keep an eye on that and just have a look at it and tell me about what sort of traffic or use you're seeing or talk to neighbours about what sort of traffic or uh, usage they've seen during their ownership. Would you agree with that, Tim? I would agree. And I'd, I'd even go a little bit further. Um, I mean, there's there's um, uh, uh, three points, three relevant points in relation to overriding interest. So so uh, um, an easement will will count as an overriding interest if it's either in the actual knowledge of the purchaser. And now, usually that, that that doesn't matter at the conveyancing stage, because if they know about it, they're not bothered about it. Um, um, or if it's reasonably if, it, if it's, I'm just looking at the wording here, um, if it uh, would have been obvious on a reasonably careful inspection of the land. Uh, um, and, and, and the third element is one that you really can't do very much about, which is that the, the easement has been used within the last year. And so it's really that second yeah. one um, uh, would have been obvious on a reasonably careful inspection of the land. And um, there's, that calls into question, well, there's an interesting question about what it is that has to be obvious. Um, it, it, it's obviously obvious that, that someone may be claiming and using a right of way if you actually see them, you know, drive up the lane or, or you know, whatever the, the particular easement that's claimed is. Um, but there's also case law that supports the view that it's not just um, uh, uh, obvious on a reasonably careful inspection if you see someone doing it but it's also if you notice features in the land that's that suggest that people do do it even if they're not doing it now so yeah one of the things that that, that i argued in this case um was that it ought, ought to have been obvious to the purchasers of the servient land that the lane that, that led to their property um in fact carried on past their property and went to the church and anyone, yeah. you know, just standing on uh, on the land, you know, standing on the lane, can see that the lane carries on. And um, by seeing that yeah. the lane carries on, it's a pretty obvious inference that someone goes up that, far, you, you know, goes up past the Soviet property. Um, and yeah. um, I mean, there was a there was a slight wrinkle in my case in that what was claimed was a vehicular right of way, uh, and not a right of way on foot. Yeah. And so there there was a a question about whether it would have been obvious that anyone drove up there as opposed to walked up up, up there but um yes um it, it, it's really the point i want to make is it's not just whether you see someone use it but you see evidence of it being having been used recently yeah. and, and so yeah. it, it's really yeah. just common sense things i think of, of, of the client um visiting the property and if they see gates and doorways and and alleyways and lanes and tracks and vehicle tracks and that sort of thing yeah just to sort of note them down and to yeah to to you know make a note to figure out who, who who's using what and by what right yes yeah because the important point there is that you know you arm the client with that information and tell the client, look, you've got to report back to me anything you see and anything that is slightly suspicious. So as Tim points out, you know, if there is a track uh, running alongside the property going somewhere, then that obviously implies that it is of use. And, you know, you're, you're put on notice, really, that, you know, we shouldn't be making further inquiries. Um, so. All of those points, I think, are important about some basic issues. On slide here, I talk about creating new rights of way. 
And the best way of creating a new right of way or a new easement is, of course, express grant. You can create easements by implication. Um, any form of implied easement always worries me on the basis that the rule in Wielding and Burroughs in Section 62, invariably you're looking at sort of sales of part and historical use that is somehow implied into current transfer. Necessity or intention always scare me to death, in particular because the courts don't like easements of necessity and easements of intent are always common, is always common intent. And of course, as far as prescription is concerned, as Tim's touched on and will develop a little further, prescriptive easements create their own problems and issues which we need to have a look at. Just on this next slide here, there's some interesting points that I want to make. Um, points of access and egress. Uh, if we could just skip to the next slide, please, Stephen, that would be great. Um, one of the things that often worries me with regard to easements is where a client has a, a wish or an intention relating to development. So this property here, I'm going to use that garage as a home office and I'm going to access the, um, the, that um, driveway on the other side of the property. Well, do I have a right of access that facilitates me choosing points of access and egress uh, in connection with my new property? Uh, other issues that I think are important relating to new easements, new rights of way, to make sure that the easement is properly protected. If it's a legal easement, it is registered and it is noted against servient titles. To think about the route, uh, not just by way of plan, but by um, description in connection with transfer and contract. To think about future land use. So are we saying that this right of way is for a particular purpose, residential property for use as a residential property, or is there potential for future use, conversion into flats, commercial activity, etc.? that would warrant the right of way to be more widely drafted? And what about improving the right of way and repairing and maintaining the right of way? There's an old case called Carter against Cole that sort of highlights that there are common law rights available to someone that has a right of way in connection with carrying out repair and maintenance for their own benefit, but not allowing the transmission of cost to uh, other per persons that have the benefit of the easement or the servient owner. And Carter and Cole also suggest that you can go on to the adjoining land, to the servient land, to affect repair and maintenance, as long as you do so uh, without uh, causing damage, or if you do cause damage, meeting cost. Um, so if we go to the next slide, that would be really useful, because I do touch in the next slide some issues about repair and maintenance. We need to think about who's obliged to construct a right of way, if it is a right of way, who's responsible for repair and maintenance. And we also think that rather than looking at the common law position, and as I say, Carter and Co is the leading authority, to look at making express provision, dealing with repair and maintenance. And as Tim and I mentioned a little earlier, the use of estate rent charges perhaps to deal with that. Estate rent charges from a buyer's perspective have their own issues. So I'd want to some form of ADR provision, some form of cap or ceiling, um, and some form of provision for reasonableness of cost if I was acting for a buyer. But if I'm a seller or developer, that might be a way of recovering cost associated with right of way. We can quickly skip on to some other points I want to make before Tim uh, goes into some detail about the case that uh, is really fascinating relating to prescriptive easements. I want to talk a little bit about abandoning rights of way. And the important point here, and again, Tim, I don't know if you've got a view about this, but uh, I'll ask the question anyway. My stance is that it is difficult, if not impossible, to establish abandonment of a right of way. In that I've seen cases where a right of way hasn't been used for 70 years. A right of way is impossible to use because of, in essence, some earth moving activity that has meant that what we've got is a, 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 an inability to pass across the right of way due to physical obstruction, but the court saying, well, it hasn't been abandoned because we don't have evidence of a fixed intent never to assert the right in the future. So whenever anyone comes to me and says, I've bought the property, but this right of way has been abandoned, alarm bells ring. Uh, any views, Tim, or any comments yeah, to make? I, I completely agree. Um... 
I think I think people imagine that that because you you can establish the existence of an easement by by long use that you can likewise establish the abandonment or extinguishment of an easement by lack of use. Um, but yeah. as, as your slide says, mere non-use is not enough once yeah. the existence of the right is established. Yeah. And because it's a legal interest in land, and so to dispose of it, to extinguish it, you'd need a deed. Uh, um, these cases only ever arise yeah. where, where, where people haven't actually executed a deed saying this easement is no more. So, so you're looking at trying to imply an intention to abandon an easement out of circumstances where no one has said that's what they're trying to do and in circumstances where just mere non-use is not enough. And so yeah. you're absolutely right, it's yeah. really, really difficult to do. <laughs> it is, yeah. It's, uh, but I often come across developers that will say, oh, we don't have to worry about that. You know, it's an old agricultural uh, right of way that hasn't been used for donkey's years. And you'll see them plan out an estate and just yeah. say, well, it doesn't matter. And uh, it's quite amazing when you sit down yeah, and say, well, it does. Um, and says, um, your, your, yeah. your estate's built right over my, my, the route for my tractor, and it'll cost you X hundred thousand yeah. pounds. <laughs> yeah. um, this, is, this is obviously where Robert... Absolutely. 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 Yeah. 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 Absolutely right. Yeah. And then I talk about varying rights of way. Again, of course, if you're varying an easement, it's best to do so by express grant necessary for the uh, easement then to be registered, a deed of variation registered at the land registry. Um, and again, important to think about if we are varying a right of way, not just the route of the way, but other issues associated with repair and maintenance. I also mention in, in the notes here on slide, easements in excessive use, and again, the court saying that in essence, they're always looking at a reasonable level of traffic in connection with rights of way, and that if anything exceeds a um, reasonable level of traffic, that would constitute an authorised nuisance. And I also mention a point that I mentioned in the past about rights of way in adverse possession. The fact that you can't claim adverse possession if you are the owner of a dominant tenement in connection with the servient tenement on the basis that adverse possession must be unequivocal. And if you have a right of way and you're using land for that purpose, then clearly your claim for adverse possession is not unequivocal. So there's lots of information about all of those points in the notes. And I've tried to make it as sort of practical as possible to sort of highlight to practitioners the dangers of abandonment, the need for procedural um, consistency with regard to variation, and the issues of excessive use and adverse possession and rights of way, creating some problems that practitioners need to be aware of. I want now, if I can, just go to the next slide for a moment. And then if we may, Tim, we'll look at your case of Hughes and Frampton uh, Arlingham, etc., the church case, which is really interesting. So we'll just skip those slides if we could, Stephen. And we've just got problem number one, slide 15 to look at very quickly. Yeah. If we're acting for a client and he or she is buying a property and the access to the property is this farm track, it is essential that we identify the legal extent of the way. So in other words, what is the extent to which we can use the servient tenement? The physical extent of the way, its length, its width, where we gain access and degress to our property, and to think about repair and maintenance. So in the winter time, if this becomes a boggy track, who's responsible for draining it? Who's responsible for resurfacing it, etc.? cetera? All, all of those things need addressing. Now, Tim. We'll come on to the case of Hughes and the um, Frampton Church case, the uh, case that you have talked about uh, briefly during my sort of presentation. And uh, I always say to um, clients and uh, practitioners that, uh, you know, when you're litigating, it's important that you attempt to have your God on your side. In this particular case, you uh, were at a distinct advantage in that you were acting for the, the church, as I understand it. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Don't know if that made any difference to the outcome. I'm sure it was all all down to my advocacy that, that we succeeded, it, rather than the 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 influence of God. The skill, <laughs> the skill but, of um, the advocate, I think, was the thing. 
Tim, the skill of the ad advocate rather than anything else. So if well, you could, Tim, um, yeah. I'll just go through the, the slide and then if you could just sort of clarify some points. It was an application to register an easement, wasn't it? Correct. And the easement was a prescriptive easement? It, it was a prescriptive and easement. And the owners yeah. of the... Sorry, Tim. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was just going to basically agree with you, yes. <laughs> go on. Okay. Yeah, uh, the Serbian title owners contested it. And there was a bit of sort of private grief, wasn't there, because of development that, that they developed an, an old school into a property. And I think there was a bit of bad blood in the village as a consequence of various different things that meant perhaps they were a little bit more aggressive than you would normally encounter or expect. Would that be fair? Yeah, I, well, I, straight answer is I, I don't know very much about that because it, because um, I was just dealing with the legal issues in the case. but. But, but on a number of occasions, some of the witnesses alluded to bad feeling in, in, in the village following the closure of the, of the village school and the, the decision by the, yeah. by the trustees of the school to sell it to, to, um, to someone to build, build a big house as opposed to provide some sort of village amenity. Um, so so that, that was part of the background. And, yeah. and, um, there was also a, a, a suggestion that the Serbian owners were concerned that the the church was claiming the right of way not to access the church but to extend the churchyard um, to to um, a, a, another side of, of the the property where they just built their their snazzy new new house. And um, it's fair to say I think yeah. everyone had thoroughly fallen out. So, so if, if, if one reads the judgment, one's probably left thinking, well, why on earth are these people arguing about this and spending money on it? Because the Serbian owners wouldn't have seen the use that, that was being made of, of the track because, because um, you know, from, from their house, they, they simply couldn't see most of the Serbian um, part of the track. And, and the part of the, the top end of the track near, near the church, they couldn't see either because it was separated off from their house by, by a high hedge. So um, it, 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 on, from the outside, it looks like a case about nothing, but um, feelings ran high. <laughs> and and um, yeah. the Serbian donors um, engaged specialist counsel who I have to say worked very hard to think of all the points that were reasonably available to them. And so it was a really good sort of trot through all of the, well, many of the issues that can arise in these cases. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. And what we were talking about in essence was an existing legal interest with regard to the easement that the church was attempting to register. And it was also potentially an overriding interest. So all of these issues were explored by the tribunal uh, that you were before. So if we can just go to the next slide for a moment, one of the things that really interested me about this case, looking at Schedule 3 of the Land Registration Act 2002, was this thing about user, Tim, and it, you've touched on this already, but can you just yeah. explain to practitioners, if you're advising someone that is claiming a easement, what you would be <laughs> looking for in connection with use in order to be successful to establish the easement and then to register it at the land registry? Of course, yeah. So um, as, as most people will know, um, prescription is the acquisition of legal rights through long use. And the, the basic principle yeah. is that if you exercise something that's capable of existing as a right over property for 20 years or more, you get to keep it. Um, there are technicalities because there, there are, for historical reasons, different types of establishing, the different ways of establishing prescription. So there's common law prescription, which uh, um, in principle dates back to the 12th century. It's, it requires demonstrating use going back that far, which arguably we could have done with a Norman church in this case. There's, there's the Prescription Act, which um, yep. uh, ha has various sort of technical rules um, which can cause difficulty, which I won't go into now, but basically has a 20-year period. And then there's the one that, that yeah. most people end up using most of the time, which is um, what's called prescription by lost modern grant. Yes. And that's simply a legal fiction yeah. that, that um, uh, if, you, if you've been doing something for 20 years, 
for such other suitably long period of time, the court will will irrebuttably presume that that your your use has a lawful origin. Hence, lost modern grant, because it used to be a fiction that 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 the court would presume that you'd been granted the right, but but the deed had been lost. Um, that, that's where the name comes from. So each of these is dependent on showing use use of the right, and depending on what the right is, um, yes, that that could be something easy to do or difficult to do. So, for example, light um, uh, always falls on buildings, and so um, it's simply a matter of showing you've got a window. Uh, um, uh, uh, drains yeah. likewise are, are used continuously, or well, depending on what type of drain they are. Rights of way cause a difficulty that comes up again and again, though, because because um, a simple case of you walk up someone's someone's lane to 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 go to the front door of your house, you're going to be using it every day. It's it's pretty clear to see that it is a right that's being claimed. Um, but yes, you get it gets progressively more difficult when you're looking at at um, rights over land that are necessarily not going to be exercised quite so often um, and yeah. so you you then reach a sort of difficult point where you you have to ask is the use intensive enough enough or frequent enough to actually yeah. justify justify claiming a right because wandering over your your neighbor's field you, you know once once every few years shouldn't be enough to get you a right as a matter of common sense yeah. um, but obviously daily yes daily use would and 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 the key is identifying the 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 boundary between the yes and the no cases and and um yeah th th this is an issue that came up um and was thoroughly debated in 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 my case because because it threw up a really interesting question is you'd naturally expect that a right to get to to, to something like a church for access. And it, by the way, it wasn't the only access, but it was a convenient access for, for carrying heavy, heavy yeah. objects into the church and also a disabled access. Um, you'd naturally expect that yes. to be fairly easily established that, 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 that it's, it's a, a right that's being claimed rather than just you know, the occasional or accidental use. Um, but but part of the difficulty was that, that, that this is a sleepy little village uh, um, in probably quite a quiet part of Gloucestershire, where um, yes. th there doesn't seem to be that much interest anymore in the ch in the Church of England and and it, its activities. And right. the evidence was that um, that that the attendance at um, the weekly church services on a Sunday was you know half a dozen or something like that. Um, yeah. And because what was being claimed was a vehicular right to to go up this lane, not everyone yes. going to the church was using it. It was only when someone needed to carry something heavy into the church, or if if, if someone with reduced yes. mobility drove up. So really, we were looking at really very occasional use, and our best evidence was was that yeah. on the very odd occasion that there was a wedding or a funeral, um, then the church would be busy and people would park all the way up this lane. Um, and so, yeah. I mean, the, the really big argument advanced on behalf of the Serviant owners, the Hughes, was, well, even if people have been using this from time to time, um, it's not enough use to, to establish a right of way because it's just not frequent enough. And so this calls yeah. in, into question how, how, much, how much is enough? And um, the, the law yes. answers the question in a sort of semi-helpful way um, as it does with a lot of these questions so 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 the legal test as established in the 19th century and supported by recent case law as well is is that the use must be yeah. such use as would bring it home to a reasonable owner of the servient land that a right is being exercised and if it is to be resisted that that uh, um uh, the servient owner must act to prevent it um, so that basically is just yes. a long paraphrase of such use as makes it obvious that it, that it's enough. <laughs> so it's kind of circular. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, yes. one of the one of the ways I think of understanding this test and and approaching this kind of question is to to ask yourself whether the use is of a character 
to other kinds that that would suggest to a servient owner that that it might happen again if they don't prevent it so so it's not yeah. really so much about how often it's used because that all depends on the on on the dominant land and how often people need to go there yes. um, but it's it's yeah it's kind of in the way that it's used because because if i'm playing football in my garden and i kick my ball out, uh, over the fence and it goes into the next door but one neighbor's garden and so i climb through my next next door neighbor's garden to go and get it that that yeah. suggests that suggests a one-off use that isn't likely to happen again or if it happens again it's not part of a a, a, a pattern that suggests i'm claiming the right to do it i'm just being a bit cheeky um but yes. but you know that's entirely different to just routinely walking across someone's field um with, without a by your leave um or anything like that so it's a matter yes. of understanding the context of the use and and its purpose and sitting back and asking you, yourself given what we know about it is this the kind of use that that is likely to be repeated um I, yes. think, I think that's the best way of approaching it and for practical purposes i think what this illustrates to the transactional lawyer is that as soon as you realize you might be in prescriptive easement territory and you establish that it's a big enough deal to you know to matter to the clients um that you've really got to go yeah. quite far into understanding the use in order to be able to give give a yeah remotely reliable view uh, on on whether the right could be established or not yeah T tim that that's exactly the point that i think is so significant that you can't just give a cursory view of a situation involving a prescriptive easement there is a requirement on you to do quite a lot of research relating to use of servient land and use of dominant land and you know as a transactional property lawyer i'm not probably being paid enough to undertake that level of research and that level of investigation but i think it's important that you do or you say to the client i'm not doing this but as a consequence that's generating vulnerability for you because i don't know the answer the fact i'm not carrying out this investigative work exposes you to the fact that there could be a prescriptive easement and the occasional use that is enough from a court's perspective we're not going to spot yeah the only other bit of assistance i can give practitioners and again really it's not assistance in solving the problem it's a way of identifying the extent of the problem if the client gets a level three survey the best survey that is possible then it's important to understand that a surveyor should also be picking up on this is an issue so surveyors are required to look at the vicinity of the property to see if there are any issues relating to value and therefore a surveyor in your case tim that was acting for the buyers the respondents in your litigation might be saying hey your solicitor should be looking at this issue relating to this lane so even if the buyer doesn't spot it a surveyor should be saying there may be an issue that flags this up that then warrants the in in investigative work that is necessary so yeah thanks for that tim on slide here we've covered unity of season because you've mentioned that already the point about criminality in your case is quite interesting isn't it could you explain to everyone the issue because you had a public footpath as you mentioned earlier running along on the lane your Correct. prescriptive easement is vehicular access but respondent says ah i've got you criminality you don't have an easement can't have an easement and could you explain how you dealt with this and how the tribunal sort of supported or endorsed the way you dealt with it? Sure. Um, well, the basic thought behind this is because prescription is all about the inference that if someone's been doing something uh, for long enough, then a, a lawful origin of, the, of that use is presumed, you know, so the grant of a right. Um, uh, if what the person has been doing is, a, is actually a criminal offence, necessarily the court can't presume a lawful origin for the right to do it <laughs> so so you can never yeah. by prescription establish to do uh, establish a right to do something that's a criminal offense um 
So the, the very ingenious opponent I had in this case um, uh, obviously dug around looking for possible criminal offences and argued that it was a criminal offence to, to drive a vehicle on a public footpath. Now, the, as I've indicated before, yeah. the, the, there was a public footpath going up the lane, which is why only a vehicular right was claimed. Um, and um, if, the, if it was indeed a crime to, to, to drive on a public footpath, then um, we couldn't establish our prescriptive right because you can't prescribe to commit a crime. Um, so uh, um, yeah. this issue involved us all blowing the dust off the Highways Act 1835 and to understand a particular, particular section in that that, that criminalises driving on a public footpath. Um, and um, yeah. I was able to, um, I'm happy to say, dig out some rather ancient case law um, where this issue had, had arisen in, in relation to, to, to um, a plot of land right back in, I think, the 1840s. And, and the court have said, basically decided that the, the, the section of the Highways Act didn't criminalise dri driving on any old public footpath. It, it, it was meant to only relate to pavements running alongside right. the road. So basically just means that if, you're, if there's a road with a pavement, you drive on the road, not the pavement. Yeah. And so thankfully that, that provided the answer yeah. to this. Which, yeah. we, we, yeah. which the judge accepted, but it just illustrates how yeah. how yeah. wide you need but to cast the net to 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 establish the existence or non-existence of a right. Now, in most cases, I mean, most things that people claim as easements yeah. are not criminal offences, and and never could be. But it's just a matter, I think, of just being aware that if if it's an unusual type of land, you know, like there's a famously there's a criminal offence of driving vehicles on common land. Um, and and so if, if yes. it's an unusual type of land, yeah. um, just sort of you, you know have ha, have your eye open for potential criminal offences. Yeah, Tim, I I always say to conveyances, be careful if you're buying <laughs> property that is near common land, village green, bridle ways, public footpaths, anything like that invariably parish councils can be quite aggressive um people in the vicinity are very protective of these rights and you just got to tread cautiously but the interesting thing about your case was that uh, you know this idea of criminality you were you were able to identify was quite restrictive in that yeah. in essence it related to the pavement and here you know there was a track and the vehicular access was along the track not interfering with the sort of pedestrian access that the public right of way permitted. And then Correct. I think we've covered the overriding interest argument, haven't we? I don't think yeah. there's uh, much more to say other than what's mentioned on slide there, unless you've got any comment, Tim. No, I, I, I think we have covered it. That's fine. I'm, I am conscious of time, so we'll, we'll push on a little bit if possible. Now, as far as the litigation is concerned, Tim, you and I had a conversation about this, and we've already made the first point about the fact you can't play at tribunal applications, even though the application relates to a land registry application. But what I wanted to do was to share with practitioners, if you can just go back to the previous slide, that when we're preparing the land registry application to register an easement, it isn't enough, in my view, simply to satisfy the land registry with regard to um, uh, statements of truth, et cetera, relating to use, that what we should be doing is thinking about what happens if our application is contested and really making sure that what we're submitting to the land registry is sufficient for land registry purposes, but also potentially sufficient to be able to uh, form the basis of our response in connection with an application to tribunal where there's an objection. Because I think in, in your case, there were statements of truth or uh, uh, stat decks submitted with the application. Correct. And then you had to do quite a lot of work with regard to the statements that then went before the tribunal. And the thing that worried me about that was, if I have submitted a statement of truth, and again as a conveyancer with a costs um, sort of uh, barrier, 
I've just I'll do the minimum to get my application to the land registry. So I won't provide all the, all the evidence that would be appropriate for a, a tribunal. So I just sort of half-heartedly put something in, and then when you're doing your work or whoever is acting on behalf of the applicant is then producing witness statements for tribunal and going into more detail, there's a danger that someone says, well, why didn't you say this right at the beginning? You know, it's one of those things, isn't it, when, you, uh, when you're providing lots of witness statements in, in litigation, there's always a danger, that, well, hang on a minute, what you've said there isn't the same as said here. Yeah. And I think the other thing, Tim, is the fact that, you know, clearly spending a little bit of money in strict counsels such as yourself at application stage can help on the basis that you can spot, well, if we go to tribunal, there's an issue here or there's an issue there, or there are things that we can submit in this application that it will help the application and will potentially give me ammunition in case the uh, application is subject to opposition. And I think the other thing, point, the, the point I make here about documentation was the fact that, again, you know, there was an opportunity as on your part for the applicant to have or find documentation that would support the uh, witnesses that you mentioned that had been going to church for donkey's years. So there might be parish records, etc., about weddings or funerals that would lend, lend a lot of support to the original application to the land registry and, of course, the application to tribunal that followed. Correct. Yeah. Um, Can I comment? In, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, um, so this idea um, about seeking as just really just to amplify your point. Uh, um, I mean, the key point is obviously the approach to evidence at the application stage obviously has to be proportionate. But as you say, it, you must always keep in mind it's the beginning, potentially the beginning of a litigation process. And and so it's fine yeah. to have abbreviated evidence yeah. and truncate investigations, obviously, as, as costs dictate. But must always keep in mind that these are potentially uh, statements. St the stat decks will be statements that will be put to witnesses in in a trial potentially, um, and so it, it's difficult. But it's a matter of finding finding the right balance. And um, I would certainly always endorse um, uh, people seeking the the assistance from counsel as early as possible. Um, but uh, you may think that I have an interest yeah. in what's yeah. not interested so, in. <laughs> So, yeah, the other point to, to note, Tim, and again, you wouldn't have been involved in this in your case, but where there is a contested application made to the land registry, the land registry, <coughs> excuse me, allocate time for negotiation to see if the parties can achieve some form of settlement. And again, that can be useful to try and determine the strength of the other side's objection or the strength of their application if you are objecting. So yeah. sometimes, you know, again, it will be a conveyancer that will be involved in that negotiation process because I've submitted the application on behalf of my conveyancing client. I don't need a litigator because it's just a land registry application. Then you get this invitation to negotiate and there's often a blurring of what my role is and again, what I would say is, you know, as you just alluded to, that this is a preliminary to potential litigation. And therefore, we need right at the outset to make sure that we've got counsel that knows about the wherewithal of dealing with issues before tribunal to assist us during that stage. If we go to the next point, um, really, about conducting the litigation and tribunal, Tim, I'd like you to tell people again about this issue of costs, the fact that if you lodge an application that is objected to, to the land registry and the land registry refer to tribunal or you refer to tribunal yourself, there is vulnerability as to costs from the outset. So you can't just unilaterally withdraw and say, oh, hang on a minute, I don't want to get involved in this. It's too hot to handle. And uh, therefore you're in and you're going to be liable for costs if you're unsuccessful. And again, Tim, you know, without sort of going into detail, the costs of this case that you were involved with and other cases that I've seen are considerable. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, 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 
it's amazing. It always amazes me how quickly parties can burn through money when you're you're litigating, even reasonably straightforward matters like this. Um, I mean, I can't remember um, exactly what the costs are in this case, but it is tens and tens of thousands of pounds. It might even be into low yeah. six figures, um, and that's yeah. that's not that unusual nowadays. But obviously, um, for for if for for what I could call ordinary clients like me and probably most of you, it's it's an absolutely huge and life changing amount of money. So obviously that needs to be borne in mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's scary stuff, isn't it? Before yeah. we go to questions, I, I want to ask Robert. Rob, Robert, you've been carefully listening in to, today, so thank you for that. But Robert, just again, so that practitioners are aware. What sort of product does Stuart Title have that will alleviate some of the issues that we've discussed? So if I'm a buyer and I've got the potential of a prescriptive easement that is going to impact on my client's use and enjoyment of the property, I assume that there are products that are sitting there that will assist us relating to potential claims, potential uh, yeah. diminution in value of property, etc. Exactly, and yeah, no, that's right. The good thing about uh, title insurance in, in this case is it can protect you whether you're trying to um, enforce the benefit or the burden of a right of way. So your example of a housing development built over an old agricultural right of way, which is seemingly abandoned, but as you said, isn't legally abandoned, uh, policies can be available there, protect against those being enforced in the future. And I think the whole point which you've stressed here which i think is a very important one about the the litigation nature of the uh, application to establish an easement if you don't think the evidence is good enough then look to title insurance to protect it um in this case it was fine i mean i know uh in uh, the case of spire and stanley a few years ago there they could only prove um use of a, a track once or twice a year and that was held to be insufficient in those cases. And yeah. in cases yeah. like that, it is probably worthwhile when you when you get those statements of truth, when you're looking at it, is taking a preliminary view as to whether it's ever going to be strong enough to establish the easement. And if not, certainly offer your client the, the option of uh, a title insurance to protect them there. And in some cases, that may be the, the better course for you to go down. Yeah, and, and Robert, I think another point that I'd like to make is, as, as Tim and I were discussing, where we've got a situation where we're saying, look, there's potentially a prescriptive easement here, and there's a lot of additional work that I as a conveyancer need to do, and the client says, well, no, I don't want you to do it, then a defective title insurance policy will protect the client, but it'll also protect the firm on the basis that, you know, we've given you this advice, you didn't want us to do this research, but we've gone down the, potentially the next best thing, or perhaps the best thing, in taking out a defective type of insurance policy to protect you. Yeah, it is It is another weapon. It's another solution. And you know, as we've established now, uh, establishing the easement is one solution. Uh, but there may be good reasons, lack of evidence, lack yeah. of time, uh, lack of you know, funds to fund litigation. We're talking, you know, as Tim was saying, possibly into six figures for the costs then title insurance is an option that you should be putting forward to your client uh, and explaining you know, the benefits of that as opposed to solicitation to establish an easement. Absolutely. Uh, and I think, Robert, the other point is, as I was explaining with Tim about you know, preparing for a tribunal, preparing for submitting an application, it's always worth just having a look and having a think about a title indemnity policy before you do anything. Well, exactly. It is an either or uh, choice once you get to that stage. And if you are going down the uh, establishing the yeah. easement, then you're unlikely to get title insurance. Similarly, if you've taken title insurance, uh, it would be unlikely that we would want you to try and establish the easement at the land registry and bring forward <laughs> a possible claim. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so once you start and then barking on something you're then blocking the potential to take out the policy so better to consider it right from the outset 
I am conscious of time, and Tim, I'm conscious of your and Robert's time too. And so, Stephen, if possible, can we have a look at the, any questions that are arising, please? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ian and Tim, for that. Um, I, I appreciate as well, we have gone a bit over the hour. So just for anyone that is listening in, thank you for staying on. And if you aren't aware, we do record these sessions. So if you do need to get off, you will be able to view the Q&A session at a later date if you, if you wanted to leave at this point. We've had a few questions in. I'd like to try and get through a few of them. Um, a few questions came in quite early. Um, so the discussion that around sort of unity of season, that kind of thing there. Yeah. Uh, but the first question from Ben is, uh, I have a piece of land where an adjoining owner is trying to register a right of way created uh, by a deed from 1928, brackets we were aware of this. Uh, does that right of way need to have been protected by a land charge where initially created for it to be valid and therefore capable of being registered on our title? I don't know if, uh, if Ian, you'd like to come in on that. Yeah. Can you just say that again for me, Rob, uh, Stephen? Sorry, I just missed the first bit. Yes, yeah, so I have a piece of land where an adjoining owner is trying to register a right of way created by a deed from 1928. Does that right of way need to have been protected by a land charge when initially created yeah. for it to be valid and therefore capable of being registered on our title? If it is, if it is a legal easement over unregistered land, then it doesn't need a land charge. It's only if it's an equitable easement would it be necessary as far as first registration is concerned i'd have to have a look at the position but my guess is that an equitable easement on first registration would be an overriding interest but tim do you, can you re recall or do i have to go scurrying and having a look at my land or books um i i, I wouldn't like to say at this stage uh, it would be, be useful to know when it was registered as well because that will tell us what um if it's uh, under the 2002 Act or the 1925 Act, um, because the overriding interest regime on first registration. Yeah, that's right, applies for 2000, yeah. Um, yeah. But um, what you're yeah. saying, Ian, sounds, sounds right to me, but it is definitely, I think, one not to shoot from the hip on, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, but would require, as you yeah. say, um, yeah. opening up some books. Yeah, you're right, you're actually, you're right. It would depend on the date of registration of the land, wouldn't it, as to whether the 2002 Act applied. So it would have to be after 2003 for it to be an overriding interest under the 2002 Act. Stephen, can we ask the delegate to drop me a note by email and I'll have to scurry and have a look at the uh, land law books and uh, come up with a definitive answer. And Stephen, I'd happy, I'm happy to send that to you and to share it with other delegates. Absolutely, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Ian, and thanks, Ben, for that question there. So, yeah, yeah a couple of around the, the issue yeah. of unity of season, yeah. which uh, Tim brought up at the start there. Um, so, Megan asks, why is unity of season different to merger? Right, it's a choice of whether to merge versus automatic. Uh, very good question. Um, I don't know. I, I think that's the, the simple practical answer is, well, that's yeah. that's what the law is. Um, unity of season, a, a extinguishment by unity of season is automatic. Um, uh, uh, and merger uh, is a matter of intention. Um, the, the, uh, when I was researching the unity of season point in this case, I did try to go right back to, to the early cases for an explanation of the underlying principle behind unity of season, because because often if you trace a rule back to its origin, you 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 get the the original scope of it, and you can make sense of the modern rule. Um, unfortunately, that didn't really lead me anywhere. All all that the ancient cases on unity of season said were, well, obviously you can't have um, someone with a right as against himself, so obviously the right disappears. Um, and that that I seem to remember the earliest I traced that back to was I think it might have even gone as far back as Bracton, which is it, which is Norman land law. Um, wow. so, um, that's a very sort of sophisticated way, uh, sound, sophisticated sounding way of saying I, I don't really know, but that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, perfect. Thank yeah. you. Tim, I thank you. Yeah, I think Tim's explained that, but it's an interesting question, actually. It's again something for me to have a look at, but I think you're right, Tim. I think you're right. 
Excellent. The the next question from Mark, which I think is relating to a similar issue. Uh, the question is, is unity of possession not also required? Um, so I think that's related to the early part of the presentation there. Sorry, Tim. Yeah, um, unity of season um, uh, is is a sort of um, it's, it's a sort of shorthand for um, uh, a, a variety of sort of common uh, commonalities. That's not the word I mean, but but hopefully it's clear clear what I'm trying to say. Um, that that are required for the unity of season doctrine to 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 uh, kick in. So so yes, you 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 need um uh, unity of possession and um there is a little wrinkle on that that i forget exactly what it is and i'd need, I'd need to look up for you but 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 the answer to the question is basically yes unity of possession um is is required but it it doesn't necessarily mean as i recall that both plots of land have to be in the same occupation um i think it is sufficient for someone to be entitled um, to possession or construct or to or to have constructive possession, which you you may do through a tenant, yeah. something like that. But um, here I'm very much explaining yeah, to you right. in yeah. a landlord book rather than yeah. um, you know speaking from any great great authority. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Daniel's question: uh, How do you find out? the historical position when the HMLR land registry do not have copy papers? So th th this is historical ownership. Yeah. Um, the, 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 Ian might have some ideas more than me. I mean, I, I mean, the, the a barrister's answer is your solicitor gives them to you. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, I mean, you can tell really quite a lot from um, from the land registry, even if you don't have um, all of the instruments that are referred to uh, on the register of title. You can often piece it together, particularly by looking at surrounding plots of land. So, for example, if you're looking at rural land in particular, yeah. um, the pattern over over the last sort of 150 years has been to break up larger land holdings into smaller ones. Which, which means that you can often trace um, trace uh, yeah. past, past ownership by piecing together when different plots were, were, were conveyed, which or uh, which may have triggered first registration and so on and so on. And, and um, that's so that's the, the land registry route. There's also other ways that you can investigate title. Um, and these are perhaps more relevant to. Yeah. to slightly further back in history. Um, uh, parish records are often very useful. Um, um, tithe maps, um, manorial records, um, particularly yeah. in the period yeah. before the 1920s. Uh, um, also um, yes. uh, local ter terriers. So it, it, it was very common in the, in the past for uh, local land owner, uh, ownership maps called terriers to be published um, and um, they can often be found in local museums and that sort of thing um, so so there's often there are often quite a yeah. wide range of resources uh, available. Tim, how, if I can just, how far you go depends on how much money yeah, and time yeah Tim, if I can yeah remember the Yorkshire used to have a register Surrey used to have a register and things like planning applications or planning permissions that they grant. You know, there are there are things that can be done to sort of investigate historical land use as well as the land registry. The land registry has dematerialized. Unfortunately, the dematerialization is not consistent from office to office. So you'll find sometimes that a particular land registry officer office has records and you'll think, oh well, next time I go to a different office, they'll have the same, they'll get some of the same documents they don't unfortunately whereas tim mentions there are ways of, of, of doing this and the other thing to mention as a transactional property lawyer you know again you know if unless your client's paying you what i say is look you tell the client look this is what can be done but there is a cost implication if as long as you've told the client what you can do and the client says, well, I don't want you to do that or, uh, you know, it's not worth it or whatever. Then you go down the defective title insurance route 
and you've got some protection yourself on the basis that, well, I did tell the client we could do this, but the client said that they couldn't afford to pay or they weren't that bothered about it. But as Tim points out, there are resources other than land registry that can assist, but I do concede the point, it is a di difficult task to sort of try and piece together ownership where the land registry dematerialized. Sorry, Tim, I've got a cross you there. No, that, I, I finished. Perfect. Thank you both. Yeah, Thanks, Ali, for that question. Um, question from uh, Susan. Susan says, if a supposed easement obliges the freeholder to maintain the track, but with the other user obliged to contribute to maintenance costs, does that mean it is not an easement? Tim, uh, sorry, Ian, I don't know if you want to come in on that one. Tim? Um, I don't think there's a there's a single answer. That one. Um, I, I, it, it's a matter of of looking at the instrument and to, and and to see exactly what what is granted. It's a matter of con, of construing the instrument. I mean, it, the big um, uh, question that jump would jump into my head is: is there an easement and a severable uh, agreement about uh, paying for maintenance? Um, you know, are, um, so, I mean, that's a long-winded way of saying yeah. I'm not sure it would depend. Ian, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that one. I, I think, again, Stephen, if you can ask the, 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 is it Susan to drop that's me a correct. note, I'll, yeah. I want some time to think about it and come up with, yeah, I'll try and come up with a sensible solution. And again, Tim, I'll share with you my view, if that's all right. And cool. share that with the people that have attended today, but I, I can't come up with a, a, a definitive answer. Uh, and uh, rather than sort of saying, "Well, it does depend," I'm not going to be helping. So let's see if we can come up with something that perhaps gives us some assistance on that one. We've, uh, we've given you lots of homework today, Ian. That's for sure. <laughs> um, but thank you, uh, Susan, for that. It's pretty homework, yeah. yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Um, Sally just made the point, actually, I think Sally may have just left the, the word around you, but Sally uh, made the point because, um, Tim, you were talking, I remember you saying about state rent charges um, and not seeing too many of them. So Sally just said, we have loads of rent charges around us. They're now requiring, uh, all requiring variation to exclude section 121. It's a nightmare, she says, but uh, <laughs> that was just a comment there from Sally. Yeah, it is, um, it is a nightmare. What Indeed, else? Yeah. Uh, I hope that the government would have a look at it or the law commission look at yeah um what i would say is 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 this i think at the bar what we see is quite different to what transactional property lawyers see because we only see stuff that that has got contentious yeah. and so um yeah um, when i think of rent charges i i think of you know old cases from years ago i don't see just don't come across that many um but uh, but i'm not surprised to hear that there's still yeah. been in, in, in the way described. Obviously, no one's litigating about that. Uh, Tim, yeah. the, the, reason you, the reason you want too many is the point we made earlier, that the cost of litigating it, you know, your 20, 30,000 pounds, your actual amount that in, involved, although significant from a client's perspective, probably not significant to justify litigating. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, you see clients and practitioners Sort of bleating quite justifiably about the problem, but very few, if any, are uh, willing to take it, you know, to test it in front of a county court judge or to test it before a tribunal. I'd also, but nonetheless, it, it, it is a problem in area for practitioners. Yeah. Sorry, Ian, if I can just <clears throat> intervene there. We do have a, <clears throat> sorry, an estate rent charge policy to protect lenders against the Section 121 problem. So that yeah. is available there, and that is acceptable to a number of lenders. So it can remove the need to uh, go and vary and remove section one to one from the rent charge. So it is available if anyone's interested in it. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for coming yeah, there, I mean, as well. Thanks for that, Robert. There, there's a solution. You know, that, that, that is a solution that protects the client, protects you, and uh, enables you to. Uh, um, Ensure that your client is as protected as they can be. 
but as, as Robert says, that the key there is to make sure that the lender is happy as well as their client. Fantastic. Thank you. Just a, a final couple of questions, both really on the uh, subject of uh, prescription, and I think looking at it slightly different angles, actually. So the first question um, from Marion is, in what circumstances uh, will the land registry upgrade a claimed restrictive easement to an absolute easement? Ian, you, you might know that better than so me. So when they upgrade, yeah, yeah. Um, the, well, it's always worth asking. I can't say that they will, but I would certainly ask the question. It's one of the things I say to practitioners, where there's an issue or problem with regard to a title, um, it's always worth inviting the land registry to consider an upgrade. If the, the, the delegate Stephen drops me a note on that one, again, I'll be able to get a better view uh, as to what the land registry stance would be. But I think there's certainly there's never ever any harm in asking the land registry about an upgrade relating to the title. Perfect, thank you, and thanks to Marion for that question. Um, so the last question that I'll I'll touch on today, oh, yeah, um, from Olivia, and it's is it how or or can you prevent someone from claiming a prescriptive easement over the land you own? And she says, for example, if the client owns a field. There is a potential for surrounding property owners to walk across the field to get them to their houses, to the road, unbeknown to the client. Should the client be writing to property owners on an annual basis to say they have no right of way across the field to protect themselves for any potential future claims and prescriptive easements? Well, yeah, what, what I normally say uh, on anything like that is I wouldn't necessarily write the people, I would put signs up. Yeah. Because you know, if you if you're writing to people, they say, "Oh, well, they don't get they don't get it." And again, what we're saying about occasional use, you know, there will be people that will be using that um, field or whatever that the owner of the field is not aware of. So putting signs up and then maintaining the signs, I think, is as significant, if if not more significant, than writing to people that you are aware are using the um, potential uh, easement, the potential right of way. What do you think, Tim? Yeah, I, I, I would agree. That's the thing that immediately came to my mind because to, to establish a prescriptive right, your use, it, it, it has to meet the, uh, the three requirements of, of, of uh, not, not in secret, um, uh, net clam, net, uh, not by permission and, and not by force. Um, and um, there was a court of appeal decision a few years ago that held that that the the not by force requirement obviously doesn't just relate to you know turning up and shoving the landowner owner out of the way, um, but but also relates to defying um, uh, signs saying uh, that you're not allowed to exercise the right. And that case was parking in a car park. Um, there was a, a fish and chip shop next to a car park owned by, by the local con conservative club. And the, uh, the club put up signs saying um, no parking, you know, members only. And um, that was held to be enough to make the use by the customers of the fish and chip shop um, uh, by force for the purpose of the rule, because it was in defiance of the club's protests. Um, and so, I mean, that illustrates that signs can be enough. So, so, so even if you know people are walking across your field, if you put a sign up saying absolutely no walking across this field, um, that that can be enough to to prevent them acquiring the easement. There's also, I seem to remember, a case that 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 says that a sign that says completely the opposite um, can also work as well. Uh, a sign saying um, you're welcome to walk across my my field to get to the road, but you do so with my permission. That may be withdrawn. Yeah, permission. Um, so, so signs, signs are the yeah. are the obvious way to deal with it. Perfect, yeah. thank you. I see all that. But I, I, I had situations where someone put a yeah. Sorry, Brooks. No, sorry, I'm um, A sales conforming said that uh, I have a client living in a gated estate. She has built an extension over her parking space, which, according to a 1989 transfer, allowed the neighbouring properties in the estate to pass over. 
a settlement agreement has been reached with two of the neighbours where the deed of surrender will be entered to with those two neighbours. Those two neighbours are subject to their own 1989 transfers. I think we will um, wrap up there. Um, I just want to say, um, Tim, thank you so much for joining us today and discussing the case. Ian, thanks always for your time. And we can also uh, contact Ian and Tim with any questions. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive an automated message from GoToWebinar. If you respond to this email directly, the replies will come to me and I can send any questions on to Ian or Tim. You will also receive a separate email from my colleague, Robert Kelly, which will contain the slides and notes for today's session. So it just leaves me to say on behalf of Stuart Title, Maitland Chambers and IQ Legal Training, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.